Hello and welcome to another episode of The Other Side of Sales. I'm Casey Jones. And I'm Ashley Early. And okay, both of us are really, really excited about our guest today, as we always are, but especially because both of us have gotten to be on his podcast, which is really, really exciting. Um, so want to just say big fat welcome to James Bodden. Yay! Thanks. Um, Yay. Uh, he is director at Outbound View and the host of the Lunch Break podcast. And right before we hit record, we were talking about how James was kind of like, you know, I'm not going to say the first because I haven't done my research to confirm this, but yeah. I think like kind of the first of the like first person wave. who 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 works at a company who isn't like a solo, isn't an entrepreneur, doesn't own their own company doing a podcast in the sales space. And I remember this is now like two years ago, I think that we did this together. And it was like so refreshing talking to like a normal person um, <laughs> uh, on a podcast and having like a really really open, really casual conversation. And it was super refreshing. And um, I've just, I've been a big fan ever since. So welcome, James. Hey, I am absolutely honored to be here. And obviously, fans of both of you, Casey and Ashley, uh, having you on my podcast. And yeah, excited to be here and, and ready to get into it. Awesome. And I just want to, um, make it really clear sort of as we get started we are recording this on march 19th and we are sort of i don't i was gonna say at peak coronavirus i have no idea if that's actually god i hope this is the peak i hope i actually kind of don't think it is but um you know one of the things we talked about before hitting record is that it would be crazy to pretend like that's not going on so Mm -hmm. We will try to not make this all about coronavirus since goodness knows, I think most of the conversations we're having these days are <laughs> solely about that. Yeah. But um, we would be, um, uh, I think, doing, I don't know, our empathy a disfavor if we didn't kind of address it. So I am really curious not to make it like just a really, really heavy start to this. But James, as you think about how this impacts your role, how this impacts your team, how this impacts the the conversations you're having on your podcast. Like, what are you thinking about, about COVID-19 and um, how it's sort of affecting you and, and the people around you? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's obviously we're in uncharted waters. And one of the first things that I realized was that you know, at every other time in my life, when I've come on a crisis, I've had at least the option to seek out and find somebody who's maybe been through something similar and talk to them and and get some advice. There is nobody that can do that for any of us right now. So that was one of the first things that I realized was that, okay, this completely levels the playing field then. Right. There's there's no person who is an authority on how to do anything. I'm definitely not one of those people. And I definitely don't need to concern myself with becoming one of those people. Um, What I've seen and what I've tried to do is operate from a place of of genuine compassion, genuine empathy. Um, My situation is a little you know, my personal situation is uh, unique because I've been working from home. I work for a completely distributed company. And so a lot of the, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to continue to work. And so my personal life outside of my son being home from school isn't really all that different, but obviously the lives of some of my coworkers are affected. The lives of our clients are affected and it's, it's a time where I think we just, we have to do away with the CTAs, do away with the links to a Calendly, <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and just start operating in a, in a compassionate way. And it's going to look different for everybody. Uh, a unique 
kind of point of view for me is that, you know, at Outbound View, we're creating outbound messaging for multiple clients, right? So it's like, we're having to think about this kind of exponentially across many different industries with many different ICPs. And so what we're doing is just addressing it client by client, industry by industry, talking with them, seeing how they feel about it, and then coming to an ag- kind of an agreement on, okay, this is how we're going to go with the messaging. This is the, some of them we've completely paused full stop because it just makes zero sense. Others were moving forward in a, in a, in a, in a different way. Right. But it's all affected by it. So it's, it's overwhelming. That's for sure. <laughs> so I got to ask a question here. Cause I'm it kind of, I literally spent my morning writing messaging, like yeah. updated COVID-19 messaging for two of my clients right now. One of which is a, in the medical space. Yeah. So they're, they're getting hit hard, but they're in medical billing. So it's this weird kind of they're hit, but they're not really hit. Yeah. We're figuring it out. But one of the things that I've noticed is a lot of sales leaders are, and I'm hearing from people, they're not putting this publicly, but I'm hearing a lot of it kind of behind closed doors of, we still don't want to give these people it out. They still have to buy product. You know, business is going to go on. So where are you on the, on the spectrum of kind of giving it out versus continuing with, you know, kind of questions. Like I'm a big fan of asking questions, like opening up conversations lately with, Hey, are you and your family? Okay. Yeah. Are you guys okay? Just starting off. If they say they're not okay, I am not going to sell to you right now. I'm not going to, yeah, you know, I, it, it's been kind of an interesting thing. And I, I told someone yesterday on a call, I've said for years, there are only two things you can do on a cold call that will kill a deal. One is lie. The other is be rude. I'm going to say the third is pretend like this isn't happening and push be, and push when someone says they're in trouble mm-hmm. because they will remember your company was the jerk who yeah. tried to take advantage during a crisis. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious what you think about kind of opening up with, Hey, are you guys okay? And if they say they're not okay, just go in deuces and stepping yeah. back, say good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I think you absolutely, if your own, if your personal business hasn't been affected by this and you're able to conduct yourselves business as usual, right? If you're even in that spot, you have to, to, to change some things, move some things around and expect that your revenue is going to be lower so that you're not putting your salespeople in a position to have to go out and ask for 15 minutes on people's calendar and pretend that everything's the same because it's not right. And if, and if you can do that, however that looks, then you, you can have your folks reach out. And, and I think, you know, there's, I've seen both sides of it. And I think going to the extreme on both sides is, is, is bad. Uh, I've seen companies that literally have nothing, like it's a sales software or some sort of thing that really does nothing. Um, come and say like, okay, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we can help save the world from COVID if you just like that, like they're going to play some part, some real part in, in solving this thing where like, you're not right. What you need to do is get out of the way and say, you know, we're here to help in our special way, right. By our suite of products that we can maybe offer for free for a little bit. I've seen that today. I think that's fantastic. You know, you can highlight the ways that you can help, but you know, I think there's, there's the spectrum of don't come in and try and act like a hero and s- use this as a way to um, kind of superficially make yourselves look better and don't go all the way to acting like it's not going on. I think it, the, the best tone is somewhere in the middle where you're concerned. Are you and your family okay? Great. Hey, I know times are crazy, but we have a product, you know, and all we want to do is help. The only way I can help is I've got this tool bag of little things that maybe will help you get some more leads or, you know, whatever your solution is. And that's how you can help. And, and if you're putting it like that, I think, and, 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 and saying, just wanted you to let, you know, let you know, this is out there, not asking for any time. I'm not an idiot. Have a fantastic day. Let me know if you need anything. I think that's, that's about as good as you can get right now. And it's going to change daily. I think that's the key, right? This is changing so incredibly rapidly. Like it's wild to think about where we were even just a couple of days ago. Um, 
you know, the story just a week ago, and, and I don't know if you're having the same thing. I think about something that happened last Monday, and that sound that feels like months ago to me. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's the thing. It's like we're still in such a like sort of super accelerated, like rapid change mode where I do think that the the we're going to have a, a little bit of a better sense of like what re, what the at least temporary reality is going to look like when things start to slow down a little bit and when the entire country is sort of on this accepted and understood self-isolation lockdown and we're not totally there yet and I do feel like and it, it, that's why I think it is interesting. Like, I think a lot of, of the businesses I've talked to have kind of said like, hey, we're just going to give it a couple weeks. We're reaching out to our clients. We're reaching out to people that we have been in contact with just to say like, hey, are you okay? Is there anything we can do? And we're not going to be trying to do anything new or conduct any new business until things have slowed down just a little bit. Um, because people are so distracted uh, right now, and yeah. and I do think it is a really fine line between helping and helping, adding value and exploiting. Yeah, and some it's really easy to cross that line, and I think everyone's going to have a different interpretation of where that line is, and it's it's kind of a dangerous game to play at this at this stage. Yeah, I, I have <clears throat> I've had this image of of like a sleazy marketer sales leader like just loving their open rates because they put COVID nineteen in the subject line, you know, and that just makes me cringe. This um, one word will triple your open rate. Uh, you know, and it's like you know, my KPIs although, are going crazy right now, you know, and it's like. Uh. But I feel like now it's tanking open rates because I don't know about you, but like literally every company I have ever interacted with in any way whatsoever has sent me an email about their COVID response plan. And, you know, when you're getting it from like, it's like, you know, I downloaded an ebook three years ago. I don't really give a damn what you're what your COVID response plan is. And so like I've unsubscribed from so many marketing emails mm -hmm. <laughs> because I have just hundreds every single day about how they're addressing this. And, you know, and, and some of it's also, it's like, they're all, there's also some desperate ones. Like just while we've been on this call, like I get probably three text messages a day from a, a salad place here in Portland that is offering these like crazy discounts. And it's, my heart is breaking for them because you know that they're like desperately trying to stay in business. I actually heard the best it's, thing. It's, it, it breaks your heart. I'll say this. I got to drop this in. Trish Bertuzzi dropped a great article today. We'll put it in the show notes on how to suddenly manage, especially inside sales and an SDR team that is suddenly remote. And one of my favorite things that she put in there, because we've all heard that, that advice of if you're able to buy gift certificates for local restaurants, so they have the cash now and then they can use it later. Um, Trish took it a step further and said, use those as spiffs mm. for your team. And I was like, oh, how did I not make that connection? So that's my now, my new pro tip for all the managers is run spiffs for your team, but like give them, like give them the option of you can expense a $50 gift certificate to a restaurant of your choice. Just please make it a local chain, not, you know. Yeah. Well, you don't, you don't, the other thing too, there's, <laughs> there's, there's also some really great, um, I don't, I don't know if this is happening in, in where, where you two are, but in Portland, there's some really, really great restaurants that have shifted their model to where you can order. They, they have a completely different menu. You can order food online. They'll bring it to your car in the yeah. parking lot. And it's basically like, like, so last night and I, I, I can't eat pasta, so I didn't eat any of it, but we basically got like, like in a foil, you know, like <laughs> baked pasta, you bring it home, put it in the oven yourselves. And, and we also got, um, <laughs> like balls of chocolate chip cookie dough. Nice. And so you can like make your own meal at home. And this is, this is like my favorite restaurant in Portland. It's like one, it, they, they were Bon Appetit's restaurant of the year a few years ago. And so it's like unreal food and you can like, they're making dinner for you. And so there's a bunch of those kinds of options where it makes this, you can take advantage of it now and it makes staying at home just like a little bit more enjoyable. 
Yeah. Yeah. James, I've got a few suggestions like now, for places in Raleigh that are doing something similar I've been taking advantage of. James and I are both in Raleigh, so shout out to anybody else who oh, might be I didn't in, the, in the that. RTP game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I do feel like now's the time to like invest in the, like, the little things that make life just a little bit more enjoyable and yeah. joyful. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting time. I think uh, one common theme that's kind of come up in the many conversations I've had this week is the it our society recently has felt very divided and lots of external things like pushing out a lot of everybody's got their own agenda that they're trying to push out and go do their own thing and it's funny how the universe creates something like this that forces you to now turn inward and now you've got all this time and all these things that you may have been you know running away from like if you're somebody that goes to work for 14 hours a day to get away from your family you are living a different life right now right you're coming to terms with some <laughs> yep. things that you might have been running away from for a while right and i know yeah. that uh you know I, I the the shift in everything being shut down you just generally have more time and you start thinking about things more and so i'm my hope is that people start taking joy in those little things i the spirit seems to be for the most part that people want to help so you know doing those things like patronizing your local shops to help them. And if you're lucky enough to be continuing to work and donating, if you can, I, I, I you know, all of that's going to help us um, get through this and, and, you know, we will come out of this. We'll be different for it. And I, and I think we can choose right now every day to come out of it better. And it's just going to be um, is an, an ever changing decision on this is the way that I'm going to choose to conduct myself, protect my family and run my business and do my job. You know, you know, it's interesting. So I think this brings, this is what happens. We've got two interviewers. No. <laughs> it, it, that's one of the things I love about sales is in a weird way, that sort of constant change is par for the course. If any department in a company is set up to pivot on a dime <laughs> and change what the day to day looks like, it's kind of sales, I feel like. Absolutely. So there's, that. in some ways, sales, but sales professionals were better equipped to deal with the uncertainty and the figure it out nature of this world. Um, versus like, I, I mean, I have some really good friends who are engineers and they are just struggling. Mm, um, and, and, you know, just it's, their, their workflow is different. Their routine is completely different. And that's not something, these are people who've been doing, I hate to say basically the same thing every day for like a decade, but very, very similar things, different projects, but yeah, the same, same thing. Processes. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. But I would say I am also talking to a lot of salespeople that are really nervous about being home and being alone. And there's a lot of young, you have a lot of young salespeople who are making really good money. So they live alone and now they are alone all the time. And that is something that most salespeople don't do super well. <laughs> and I do think like, I, I do think it's also, I totally agree with you that salespeople are like really super good at adapting and kind of pivoting. And I think we are going to see a lot more of these like, these ad hoc like virtual happy hours and these kinds of things that to help us feel all connected. But I think that's going to be the biggest struggle. Um, and actually, um, I'm trying to remember who it was who was saying this on LinkedIn, where he was talking about how he's been working remote for the last couple of years. And it really killed his creativity and his productivity because he's somebody that really feeds off of the energy of other people and being alone all the time was really hard. And I think yeah. I think we're going to see a lot of people go through that. Mm -hmm. um, but I also had a question for you, James. Like We talked a little bit about how you've built your career, how you've gone through some like, sort of toxic work situations. You built your career to, to put yourself in really healthy, supportive work environments to get out of that. And I, 
you know, we, you were talking about how this is going to be sort of a, a period of self-reflection and self-awareness for a lot of people out there. What is your recommendation if when folks are home and you've got more time to kind of think about your life and you're realizing that there's things about your life and your work and that you just don't like, what's your recommendation for some of those people of like, how do you come to grips with that? And how do you start to make the changes that you think are going to make the difference? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll speak directly to the career side because I think the personal side that's tends to be very layered and can be a little bit more complicated to, to <laughs> make some of those changes. So I'll just focus on the career side because I have nothing figured out on that side and <laughs> wouldn't want to <laughs> lead somebody down a bad, bad road. But, you know, in my career, uh, first of all, it's come from, from failing to do that. Right. So I, I spent years in, in, in industry and, um, doing something that I knew I didn't want to do. And I continued to do it because I was scared to leave. You know, I was in retail wireless sales and, um, you know, was checked out for two and a half years uh, before I decided to leave that industry. And it was, and it, and it just completely um, was the wrong move. Right. And so you do that long enough and you realize, and then you finally make the change and you realize, okay, never doing that again. So a lot of it comes from trial and error, um, but, but really what it comes down to is, is realizing that you are not doing anybody any favors, especially as a salesperson, you're not doing anybody any favors by sticking around somewhere. If your heart's not in, in it a hundred percent, if you aren't able to kind of lock into whatever you need to do to perform well in that role and, and what I learned was uh, just because I went through that first phase of staying in a role that I didn't like, and I learned that lesson, I still encountered roles that I started that I wasn't a good fit for. The leadership was wrong. The industry was wrong. I didn't get it. It didn't click. Uh, but what I learned was instead of three years, it was a 10 month stint, <laughs> you know, within 10 months I, and, and really within like eight and a half, nine months, I had already seen that, no, this isn't going to work. I need to leave. And, and really when you realize that you're not doing anybody any favors and you're not being reckless by identifying these things as quickly as possible and, and then going about taking the steps to, you know, for me, it was like, just, all right, I'm going to clean up the resume and start looking and things like that. Um, you know, knowing that it's really in the best interest helped me because before it was like, oh, well, I don't want to be a quitter. I don't want to put my family in a serious, you know, in a serious position or anything like that. Well, that's not the case, right? You're, you actually are doing everybody a disservice because you're in a bad mood. You hate your boss. Everything's shitty. And it's at the end of the day, largely, if you're lucky, up to you and you have that ability to make a move. Um, those toxic workplaces, though, when you're when you do make that decision and you, and you know that you need to leave, not getting yourself into the same situation is just so important. <laughs> and I, that seems like obvious <laughs> advice, but a lot of salespeople I feel will take a job sometimes based on money because the money is so good and they kind of ignore the rest of the stuff that may be super big red flags uh, that they're going to end up struggling with. Um, I think for me very quickly, you know, the last two or three jobs that I've taken strictly because of the leadership, literally only because of the, literally the person that I knew that I was going to be directly reporting to and working with the most, that's how I made that decision. And, and yeah. before it was money, it was how close is, is it to my house? How long is the commute? What industry is it? all these other things, I eventually made enough mistakes to narrow it down to if I like the people and I feel like they will teach me something, I can learn something and I can grow here, that's going to do away with a lot of the toxic things that I've dealt with. So it's been an evolution, trial and error for sure. Um, but now it's just heightened self-awareness, 
not being afraid to come to terms with the fact that you maybe made a bad decision and got yourself into a role that's not a good fit for you. Um, and then, you know, having the courage to move on from it. Right. But I, mean, I think something in there you said, I kind of want to call out is a good point. It's, you said, you know, may, some, maybe you made a bad decision. I've done the same thing where I've joined companies and been like, oh, this is not going to work. It happens because you can't know everything in the interview process. And even if they say everything in the interview process, you can jump in and say, oh, they said they're cash flow positive. Not really. <laughs> and no, they're not doing this. And yes, they're doing all this hiring, but maybe they're doing all that hiring out of desperation right before they're about to close their doors. Mm -hmm. There are always going to be things you don't know. You can't control what they didn't tell you. You can control whether or not you choose to stay in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm now going to pivot back to you with a question. How do you handle an employer who says, oh, well, you're a jumper. I think you you could be a risk. Yeah. You, you've, you've had three short stints in a row. Yep. How do you defend yourself against that? Yeah. So what I did, I recognized, so I, I got out of wireless retail sales, got into inside sales. The first job I had, I was there for a year and a half. And that was like a natural progression job move. You know, I just, I had kind of outgrown the company and they were, they wanted to keep me there, but just didn't really have anything for me. And so it was a good mutual kind of uh, departure. The next job I had, I had for 10 months, I was a physician recruiter and I was horrible at it. I, I just so bad. <laughs> um, I had a one-on-one -on -one, and this is like seven, eight years into my sales career. I had a one-on-one -on -one with my sales manager and he was like, you know, man, I just think you're a little green. You know, we'll work, you will we'll get you there, you know? And it was like, okay, well, if that's the impression that he has, I'm obviously way off here, you know? And so um, <laughs> my confidence was pretty low and uh, then went on to, you know, find a BDR position and fell in love with that. But really what I realized was, okay, if, if I'm going to take the path of not being afraid to leave places and not being afraid to have shorter stints. Like I left the next company after about a year and then that company I was at for another year, you know, so I've averaged about a year since, um, first big pivot was I'm not going to look at corporate America really anymore for my next role because the conversation with corporate America is much different when you've got, 10 month stints, one, one year stints. I mean, you may not even make it through their ATS, right? I mean, just yeah. <laughs> with their little filters on their resumes, right? And um, so that was the first decision. Okay, well, not doing that solves me, you know, saves me a lot of headache because I'm not trying to fight a fight that I'm really going to lose a lot of the times without even a fair chance. Um, inside of that, building a personal brand, huge for me. Right. Huge. I mean, I lost my job in 2014 and spent the next, you know, I filed for unemployment. I was going to the library to print off resumes. I was spending my days driving to place to place, trying to find another job. It took me about a month and a half. I lost my job in 2019, last year, last summer, out of the blue. Um, just did away with the business development department and the marketing department. And because of the things that I had done on LinkedIn, I put one post on LinkedIn and had a job in two days. Right. So, and I don't, <laughs> and I don't say that to brag. It's literally just because I just had built a network. I didn't have a network before. Nobody knew. I didn't know any other salespeople. I wasn't on LinkedIn. Nobody knew what I was doing. And then, you know, five years later, lots of people knew what I was doing. And that helps tremendously when, when you're out there and you maybe have a few six month stints, there's so much context. Like, Blake, we, I, I don't think the CEO of Outbound Views ever seen my resume, ever. I don't think I even have an, an updated one to send him. Um, it, it was purely off of, hey, we know each other. We end up at the same water coolers. You seem like you know what you're talking about. Let me ask you a few questions to make sure, <laughs> you know, and validate some of these things and make sure you're the real deal. But um, that's another huge thing. You know, you can combat, yeah. you can combat the job hopper label by developing a strong personal brand. So you can point those hiring managers to like, Hey, like, uh, check me out and listen to what I have to say and hear how 
thoughtful I am about this profession and how passionate I am about it. It's, it's a huge game changer. It's the smartest investment I think that any business professional can make. And it's yeah. one that if you're not, if you're not serious about it, if you're not really making an investment and that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you have to be putting doing videos. It doesn't mean you have to have your own podcast, but it does mean you have to be putting yourself out there, building your network and and sharing your insight and your expertise. Um, it is it will pay dividends in so many different ways and look like it's also kind of hilarious because I think the three of us are all friends and are all connected and would all do things for one another because of our personal brands and how our personal brands intersected and, and are supporting one another. And so it's also, it's kind of crazy. I mean, I never, I never years ago ever thought that I would be the kind of person to be like, oh yeah, most of my really close friends now are people that I like met first on social media or we met me and Ashley in, yeah. in, in the ladies room. But then it's like, all of our conversations online that then took that like random interaction into something so much deeper and, and so much more powerful. And there's just, I, I know it can be like an intimidating thing, but holy moly. And especially now when you're all home, <laughs> you know, now is the time to like time. invest in that personal brand. <laughs> and I'll say this of the three of us, I think if we had like stock prices for our personal brands, you two have this on lock. I'm still figuring it out, I feel like. I don't and, know about that. Eh, I, well, I don't know about that either. Okay, I, well, I think you sell yourself short. Well, that would be on brand for me anyway. Yeah, I was um, going to say, that's, that's good. That's exactly. Yeah. The self-deprecating is right there. But the, I was going to say, the point is, just like case, what Casey said, I got a job offer. I ended up not taking it. Literally off of the description I put of myself on LinkedIn, and an article that I wrote that no one read. Because when they looked at my resume, they're like, hmm, this person looks a little weird. And they went to my LinkedIn, they read that description, which they liked, and then they're like, oh, she wrote an article. And they loved what I wrote in the article so much that they pretty much, they pretty much fast-tracked me to, to get me an offer. <laughs> um, it doesn't have to be much. And at that point, I was selling network security, and I just did an article on, I'm sure you can go find out, like, culture is it was basically me saying culture is not culture and like stop trying to pretend that ping pong tables are culture. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But if you've yeah. got something to say, whether it's about how sales is done or how you do your job, it, there's never any harm in just putting that stuff out there. You might not get a ton of reaction. It might not go viral, but you never know the impact it'll have. That article was like six months old. I didn't even think to submit it to them and they found it Yeah, and then yeah. told me later how much it meant. And I was like, Oh, great. Cause I really want to re-edit that. But yeah, you know, and this is something that I, I sometimes forget to mention um, when I talk about LinkedIn and the experience that I've had, I don't have a large network. I have under 10,000 followers um, at the time where I was able to find a job. I mean, I, never had a large following. I don't think anything I've ever put out has gone viral by viral standards. Um, but it's just the consistency and it's more of the, maybe the direct messages that you're doing and, and just being visible. I mean, just, just the yeah. sheer visibility of, Hey, this is me. This is what I do. And here is a little bit of how my brain works and some opinions I have on things. What do you think? Right. It just, so much better than a freaking resume. <laughs> yes. Well, and, you know, I, I think that's it, right? It's the consistency. So they might see that you've jumped around to jobs, but you're really consistent about being out there and saying these things. And I think the really key thing too, for anybody that's listening, because one of the number one questions I get is, is, uh, yeah, but I'm really uncomfortable bragging. Dude. <laughs> can you like if you think of every single person that you really admire who has, has 
a great personal brand, do they just get up and talk about how great they are? No, they're actually talking about things that they tried that they totally failed at or things that they're thinking about or how they think about it. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just about, it's about sharing. It's not about bragging. And I think, um, and I think that's the other reason why, like, James, you, so many people resonate with the stuff that you put out there is you're very, very real. And there, it just feels like if you watch you on your podcast, if you read the stuff that you write, it just, you get a very good sense of who you are as a human. You just feel like a really, really real person. And it makes, and that's the other thing that's kind of fun about a personal brand is like, people you don't really know will feel like they know you. Mm-hmm. And there's mm-hmm. something, you, you actually kind of like speed up the friendship process, which is kind of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we were talking about this earlier before we hit record, but the whole reason my podcast is called the Lunch Break Podcast is because I had to make sure that my bosses at my job knew that I wasn't using time on the clock to record a podcast and the only time that I had to do it because I have a 10 year old son and family and other things going on was at work like within those eight hours right on my lunch break and so um, it's always been my decision I guess to speak from a very real place I think it also comes from as you were saying that oddly enough I was thinking about why why do I speak that way and choose to do that. I think it's because I had a previous stint of social media um, interaction in on the MySpace days. I was an aspiring hip hop artist, right? And please tell me there's a demo out there somewhere. There's a there's MySpace pages. The music doesn't work anymore, but you can go see pictures. It's fantastically hilarious. We'll um, add these to the show notes. Yep, we will, we will put this links. in the show notes. Yeah, I'll give you guys the links. <laughs> oh, man, I can't believe I just did this. Um, but <laughs> so, you know, I was like 19, right? Uh, me and, you know, I was a part of like three different record labels, uh, local record labels, because that was the thing. And, um, you know, so much of it was about your image and your persona and, your, and the way that you, you know, you were basically pretending the whole time, right? And I found that to be very, very exhausting, right? Wait, J- James, you're, you're not a straight up thug? Well, and not even, <laughs> you know, not even uh, that that was uh, what I was even talking about, but just just the, um, like when I would do shows, right? You, you know, you're putting, you're putting on a show, you're performing, you're a, a, a amplified version of whoever you're deciding to show up as, right, in those scenarios. Um, and I found that to be pretty exhausting. And so I said, if I'm going to do social media again, because I had gotten rid of Facebook, I gotten rid of Instagram and Twitter, and I really wasn't doing anything when I found LinkedIn, um, it was, okay, well, the only way that I can do this is by being as just myself, because that's the easiest thing to do. Um, it's like, you know, when you try and wear... Um, I don't know, like extra for me in high school, like trying to wear extra cool clothes that were uncomfortable. By the end of the day, like I'm just trying to go home and put on my regular clothes. I don't care anymore. I don't care if I look cool. I'd ra- It's easier for me to just be me. I think that's where that came from, you know, and that's um, made it so that I can continue to show up, right? And on brand isn't really anything other than just me, <laughs> you know, showing up every day and talking about what I think. So makes it easy. It's the lazy man's way of building a personal brand. <laughs> and forget the lazy man's way. It's the right way. You know, it's the it, right it, way. Like you're talking about clothing. The first thing came to mind, I'm sure Casey, same thing, shoes, especially for girls. Well, like I honestly, I wanted to just be like, welcome to being a woman in the workplace. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, this is, up. this is why I, yeah, this is, this is why we work in tech though, because yeah. the, mm-hmm. the demands are a little less high. Um, so, and I like, I think everybody listening gets what a ridiculously real person you are. And I really appreciate you sharing all of this. Um, I know I, for one, could talk to you for a million hours, but we have to start wrapping. And so we end every single episode with um, our lightning round of questions. And these are meant to be quick and mostly pretty fun. And so to kick us off, 
What's your morning routine? Okay. So right now, COVID era, I am sleeping until about 7.30 or 8 o'clock because once I wake up, the day is going and it's going uh, a million miles an hour. Um, so right now I really don't have much of a morning routine. I'm waking up, I'm taking the dog out, I'm making coffee, and then I'm probably getting on a call within 20 to 30 minutes of, uh, actually waking up. So yeah, no fancy morning routine right now. <laughs> good. Right. Thank God I'm not the only one who does that. <laughs> yeah. Pick one person who's had a significant impact on your career. Mm, my first retail sales manager that treated me with compassion and empathy, Rena Wall. I can't find her on LinkedIn. I don't know how to find her, but she was the first manager that I ever had that sat me down and looked at me and asked me what motivated me, uh, learned about my family, knew my son's name, and, and completely changed my career um, because that's when I started to take it seriously because I felt like I had somebody in my corner. So shout out to Rena Wall. She was the best. And she was a fantastic awesome. salesperson. That's awesome. Um, okay. What's your pump up song? Two of them. One, um, Return of the Mac. I don't know who sings that. I don't know the guy, but it's an 80s song. It goes yeah. like, return up the Mac. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I mean, anybody, I don't know how you couldn't be in a good mood after listening to that. And then um, if only for the first like four seconds of it is Hypnotized by Notorious B.I.G. Because the way that song starts. Oh, hell yeah. yes. Boom, 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 boom. I could be doing anything. And if that starts, I'm dropping whatever I'm doing and I'm <laughs> vibing out for at least the first 30 seconds of that song. So yeah, between those two, awesome. I'm feeling pretty good. I love That's it. It's fabulous. What's one thing you wish you'd learned earlier? That I am better off building a personal brand to ensure my own employability than anything else. Um, learning about the product that I'm selling at the time is important. Learning about all those things job specific is important, but developing a personal brand that can carry me through whatever job I have. Uh, I wish I had figured that out sooner for sure. What's your favorite sales book? It's a tie. So one would be the sales development playbook by Trish Bertuzzi. Because when I read that book, I was a 28 year old first time BDR and had no clue what I was doing. And, and that book made me feel like I knew what I was doing, which was fantastic. Um, gave me such a great foundation to start and learn. And it made me look smart in meetings. It was fantastic. Um, and then my second favorite is a book by a gentleman named Chris Murray. It's called The Extremely Successful Salesman's Club. And it's uh, basically about, it's a fiction novel based in like the 1800s, uh, which is just an era that I love in general. Um, and it's about a young man whose uncle inducts him into this extremely successful salesman's club and teaches him about the right way to be a salesperson. And the core tenets of what he learns and what they cover in the book is absolutely a self-help personal development sales book and they and the things that they talk about are fantastic but it's short kind of packaged in this fictional story that's uh fantastic to listen to on audible Ooh, that's adding i'm adding that to my playlist because that's awesome fiction yeah. that's fantastic daniel disney recommended it uh and okay. yeah so it came highly recommended from him so i knew it was, had to be good and i it's fantastic that's fantastic all right What's one way someone could have been a better ally to you? I would say uh, in, the, in the realm of sales leaders that I've had that have maybe been less than fantastic and fabulous <laughs> would be coming to me and, and, and looking me, you know, basically doing what Rena Wall did, right? at the end of the day, the end before, you know, as we're all kind of walking out, Hey, come here for a second. How are you? Who are you? What motivates you? 
how do you like this job? You know, just really, and not in a formal one-on-one, not as he's checking off boxes, not as she's filling out a form. No, it's just a real conversation. Uh, and, and um, you know, I've definitely had a few sales leaders that I wish were a little bit more of my ally on the emotional support side of things, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So in light of that, how are you working to be a better ally to others? I think, especially uh, now as a leader. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the first things that I think about is being very vocal and especially because I work for a completely distributed remote company. And so there are coworkers that I have that I've never met in person and people that I need to connect with that I've never met in person. And so for me, it's being very outward with my communication and, and, and like appreciation of them. So I am not shy about calling up one of the folks that we have that's on the phones every day and just saying, I admire you so much. Thank you so much. Like yesterday, um, one of our SDRs booked a meeting and I told him, I called him and told him, I was like, you made me feel better about the world right now when you set a meeting, right? I mean, that's the effect that you're having because it makes me feel better about business. It makes me know that things are still moving and, you know, in this crazy time. Um, So it starts with, not being shy about just praise and appreciation and you're the best and, and just never feeling like it could be too much. I think that's a great place to start. Well, just before Ashley asks you the last question, can I just say that like everything that you're saying makes me feel better about humanity and about the world. So the, the, spread the praise around because uh, you're, you're doing the same thing for us. And I really yeah. appreciate We're it. We're doing virtual high fives. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, fine. And last question. What's your guilty pleasure after a bad day? Man, I love some Netflix. I love trailer park boys on Netflix. It's one of the most <laughs> vulgar, dirty shows I've ever seen in my life. And I definitely watch it when I've had a bad day. Cause after you've watched a few episodes of trailer park boys, you, you feel like, wow, I've got my stuff together. You know, it's a, <laughs> a fictional comedy show, but um, everybody's just such a mess, you know? So yeah, my guilty pleasure is definitely some, some um, maybe a little bit stupid or dumb comedy on Netflix to wind down. <laughs> Love it. Uh, well, James, thank you so much for this. Uh, this was, this kind of made my day and made me Me feel a little bit better about everything going on. Um, uh, everybody listening, appreciate you listening through all of this. Let us know if there's anything we can do for you. Um, and go find James on LinkedIn. If you're not following him, do it because his content is amazing. He is amazing. His podcast is freaking awesome. And not just because Ashley and I have been on it, although. Yeah, Casey, totally... you were episode like two, right? She was, she was one of the, she was within the first 10. Yeah. yeah so Casey's in the first 10. Yeah, I think I, I, I know. Yeah, I know it was, I know it was early. I don't think it was two. I think it was like three or four, but early, early, early. Yeah. The only reason I know is I know you were like episode like less than 10. And I will always remember James. I was, I'm so honored that I was episode 42. Because as a huge fan of Hitchhiker, I'm so thrilled for the honor that I was the answer to everything. That's it. So That's it. you should go Such look those nerd. up. Yes. No, I love um, the best. You know, yeah, I just real quick, I love what you guys are doing. Um, and you both have been supporters of mine. I'm happy to be and continue to be and will be supporters uh, of what you guys are doing because I think you both are fantastic in your own right. And I love that you both have come together to do this. So love it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, Thank you so much for doing it. Um, And everybody, as always, come find us on social. Hit us up if there's anything that we can do for you during this really challenging time. And please like and review the podcast. And please make sure also, if you're not in our Bravado community, we're going to be posting a lot of stuff um, 
got some really yes. cool things in the works if they're not already announced by the time yes. this airs. So definitely make sure you're a um, member of the Bravado community, following us on LinkedIn, and make sure you sign up at the website for our blog and news blog and all those sort of things there, as well as don't forget to take the State of Sales survey, which is going to be open at least through the end of April. We need as many people as possible taking that. So just go to othersideofsales.com, and in the menu, you'll see a State of Sales survey. So make sure you go in and do that as quick as you can. Big thanks to our sponsors for the survey, Vanilla Soft Bravado and Sales Loft. And James, thank you so much again. This has been delightful and all sorts of fun. And thank you listeners. And we will hear, see, see and hear from all of you again on the next episode of The Other Side of Sales. Thanks everyone.